At the time of the release of this here, whatever it is that you're about to listen to, Reasonably Sound has been on something like a hiatus for nearly six months. And it still is. It'll be a little bit before we get to the regular upload schedule again and episodes that sound the way that you're used to hearing them. But in the meantime, I'm going to try to upload a few short whatever it is you're about to listen to. Ruminations, let's call them. Maybe. Unless I come up with something better. Cogitation? Maybe disquisition if we want to be ironic. Anyway, I'll be putting these on SoundCloud for now. Maybe iTunes later for a couple reasons that are just very boring and not interesting for me to explain. Oh, and if you are a patron, these are free of charge. I'm going to say more about why at the end of this here. You get the picture. Let's talk about drunk people. A good number of us have been there. Brian, you get a chance. I have another. You have maybe one. Too many. This is your birthday. This is your pal Cindy's birthday. This is somebody at the bar's birthday. And whoops, there goes your self-control. Three sheets to the wind. Drunk as a skunk. Lit up like a Christmas tree. Annihilated discombobulated. I suppose it makes sense that all of the euphemisms for being drunk are hard to say when you're drunk. So, okay. But why the slurred speech after you've had a few? What causes it? At the heart, or I guess head of the matter, is this little hunk of brain meat called the cerebellum. It's at the back of your skull, sort of low, underneath the big slimy wrinkly thing that you would draw if I were to ask you to draw a brain. That brain caricature that you would probably draw wouldn't include a cerebellum, even though it's a pretty important brain piece. The cerebellum does a lot, but one of the more major things it does is regulate motor control. It doesn't initiate movement, but it influences it by contributing to our proprioception, the embodied perception of our own actions in the world as we take them, our position, our bodily state, as it were. The cerebellum is the home of motor coordination. It's the thing that perceives the difference between what you intend to do and what you're actually doing, and then adjusts accordingly so that the two are more in line. And before you ask, yes, the cerebellum is implicated in explanations for why certain people are clumsy, but it's not the only contributing factor. Eyesight, image processing, short and long-term memory, and a whole host of psychological factors can contribute to a general clumsiness. It's not just the cerebellum. I'll put some links in the show notes and on reasonablysound.com, which, hey, that is a thing now that you can go and check out. I'll put some links there, anyways, about clumsiness, if you want to do a little reading about it in general. It's pretty interesting. But okay, if you find yourself coordinated, graceful, and precise in your movements, Let's just get some drinks in you. Alcohol, as we have all witnessed at some point or another, will take care of that lickety schlitz. But okay, how and why? Well, after a few drinks, it's thought that the alcohol in those drinks causes an increase in the effect of a certain type of inhibitor cell in the brain, in the cerebellum specifically. An inhibitor, you guessed it, inhibits. So when the rest of the brain, the cerebral cortex, the medulla, are telling the muscles to do stuff and the cerebellum is trying to listen and influence what the other brain bits and those muscles are doing, it's inhibited. The effect of those inhibitor cells is magnified and so they inhibit more than they normally do. The transmission mechanism for making things transpire as they should, a process involving phrases like granule cell, mossy fiber, and dendritic claw, so I'm going to leave the specifics to the brain professionals, the transmission mechanism that allows the cerebellum to get involved in the muscle party is inhibited because you decided to go to Cindy's party and drink seven natty ices, yuck. And just as a quick digression, I want to make it clear that it's not like after a bunch of drinks, your cerebral cortex and medulla are like just trying to get their job done. And here's the cerebellum all like, you guys are a bunch of squares. Let's party. Your cerebral cortex and your medulla are also totally sloshed. 
A drunk cerebral cortex is what makes you depressed, makes you lose your inhibitions. A drunk medulla is what slows your heart and lowers your body temperature, making you feel deceptively all warm and, more significantly, sleepy. Which is a roundabout way of getting back to the point and saying that slurred speech may start, in some sense, in the cerebellum, but other parts of your brain are implicated in the creation of slurred allocution as well. The cerebellum isn't able to properly perceive or affect voluntary mouth, face, and tongue movements initiated by the cerebral cortex, which itself is having a hard time, one, initiating those things in a timely manner, and two, giving two flying f that things aren't going exactly as they planned because, hey, I'm just trying to have a good time, okay? Meanwhile, the medulla is looking at everybody else like, you guys, this is fun, but aren't we all just like really sleepy, like... Laying down in Cindy's bathtub seems like a perfectly fine thing to do. A slur is not being able to, not caring that you can't, and often just being too out of it to notice that you don't have proper fine control over your sound-making mouth section speaking muscles. It's also, at least popularly, the sign that someone is having a good time. Slurs, when they are of this variety and not of the chronic ataxic dysarthria variety, when slurs are caused by an otherwise good time associated toxin like alcohol and not mercury poisoning or a degenerative neurological disorder, are funny. They're a joke. People talk silly when they had some drinks. <laughs> In movies and on TV, on countless SNL sketches, the slur is a symbol that someone has maybe cut just slightly too loose, but they're still doing well enough to stumble home or be poured into a cab or whatever. Compared to portrayals of the non-slurring drunk, the solemn and earnest drunk, that's a different character altogether. For all the revelry popular culture codes into drinking, the serious drinker, not slurring, not drinking socially a la mad men, not drinking to party, insert frat movie here, style, but drinking to drink for the matter and fact of it, showing no outward sign of intoxication, be it a slur or the regularly deployed Woo! is a conflict of terms. The liquor becomes potential energy, at this point unexorcised as hilariously pronounced words or a good old fashioned trip and stumble. We can only guess We'll only have to wait and see just how drunk the serious drunk really is by other means as the obvious signs are absent. This wager, how drunk are they really, is a fraught and sad one. There's some truth to this, too. Generally speaking, the blood alcohol level where someone who does not normally drink would exhibit signs of extreme drunkenness, stumbling, inability to speak coherently, is the point at which someone who drinks heavily and often would begin to show signs of intoxication. It's not that they are not drunk, it's that in this respect their body does not betray just how drunk they really are. The slur works both in real life and popular culture, in entertainment I think, to signify drunkenness, but also vulnerability, inexpertness at drinking or being drunk, which maybe that isn't such a bad thing. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this short rumination on slurred speech has been Reasonably Sound. Reasonably Sound's theme music is by Will Stratton, and visual branding is by Tita Tep. You can find Will at Will Stratton, that's with two T's, dot net, and Tita at Tita Tep, that's T-I-D-A-T-E-P dot com. Please be responsible when you drink, and of course, never drink and drive or let your friends, really just in general, when you're out with your pals, just look out for one another, all right? And if you feel you have a problem, need help, or just want to talk it through, there are lots of options out there. It's not just AA and cold turkey anymore, really, I promise. If you're in the U.S., the Department of Health and Human Services Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has a toll-free telephone number for questions about alcohol and drug treatment referral. It's 1-800-662-4357. 
You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at Reasonably SND and me on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Snapchat at Mike Rugnetta. If you can and want to support the show, it would be greatly appreciated. You can head on over to patreon.com forward slash Reasonably Sound. I'm going to try to do a few more of these ruminations while reasonably sounds general hiatus and transfer process continues i won't be charging for them on patreon since they're not what i'm comfortable calling full episodes but if you really want to show your support you can tell your friends about the show encourage people to listen to the back catalog you can write reviews on itunes it's super helpful you can follow uh the show on soundcloud um you can also become a patron of the show for when i do start uploading releases again if you are not already or if you are already a patron you can temporarily increase your per episode pledge for the first couple episodes once I'm fully back, which man, man, I hope it's soon. I'll give you some fair warning so that you don't get charged extra out of the blue. I don't want to surprise you. Y'all have been so patient and incredible during this massive transfer and overhaul. Your support has been crazy and incredible and humbling and everything. So thank you a thousand times. And once this whole transfer process is done, we are going to throw a party in Brooklyn. And if you can make it, you are invited. I'm serious. It's a party. <laughs>